to the borders, Vermonters come down with your breeches of deer skin and jackets of brown. With your red woolen caps and your moccasins come to the gathering summons of trumpet and drum. Come down with your rifle, let brave. Coming out on a great day, and uh, hopefully we won't be too hot in here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice crowd. Mm -hmm. On behalf of the uh, Bridgewater Historical Society, I'd like to all welcome you here to the uh, Bridgewater Grange for today's program. Uh, it's Vermont Women in the Civil War by Howard Coffin. This is a Vermont Humanities uh, Council Speakers Viewer event, and it's hosted by the Bridgewater Historical Society. A couple quick thank yous. First of all, I would like to thank Alice Paglia and the Bridgewater Grange for mm -hmm. allowing us to use this hall. Mm -hmm. We needed the extra room. Howard's always uh, packs them in. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to let you know this is being recorded and you'll be able to, if your family friends were not able to make it today, it will be available um, to view on YouTube and some Comcast stations. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Vermont Standard. Their latest uh, edition this week's edition has uh, two wonderful stories. Uh, the first one is about the event today with Howard. And the other is about uh, the Bridgewater Historical Society's exhibit, mm -hmm. um, Camp Life. Mm -hmm. uh, we are located at 12 North Bridgewater Road, in the, uh, the Little Red Schoolhouse. We are open the second and fourth Saturdays uh, of the month from 10 to 2, and we welcome you to come to see, to see our exhibit. Um, the Historical Society is very pleased and happy to have Howard um, here again today. He's done other programs for us in the past, all outstanding, well uh, attended, and appreciated by, by all. Um, today, we'll be talking about Vermont women and the Civil War. And as most of you may know, uh, Howard is a uh, Vermont and Civil War historian and has written several books. and. Actually, you can browse through them over there later on. So, without further ado, uh, please give a warm welcome to Howard Coffin. Can you hear me? All the way back there? Good. Very nice. I haven't been in this building for 35 years, I think. My uncle Warren retired from his job at the health center, and they had a party for him upstairs. That's the last time I was here. Um, three years ago, I was invited to give a couple of speeches in the Shenandoah Valley uh, at Cedar Creek. And I was going, decided to make a week of it and visit some other battlefields. And so on the whim, I called my sister Jane. And she said she'd love to go, and off we went for a week. And we went to Gettysburg and Antietam and the Shenandoah Fields, Cedar Creek, Winchester. Oh, we had a blast. And she and I especially fell in love with a place called Harper's Ferry in West Virginia where the Potomac River is met by the Shenandoah River. And it's down in this valley and the cliffs rise. There's all these old Civil War buildings. We just loved it, just loved it. About a year ago, an historian friend called me and said that a discovery has been made at Harper's Ferry. Right by the Potomac River, they found a big old iron hook anchored in the bank and figured out that it was holding a pontoon bridge that crossed the Potomac that was used by the Union armies after the Confederates destroyed the bridges there. And yes, the Army of the Potomac crossed it several times, but on his way to Antietam, Abraham Lincoln crossed it. Oh, I was so excited, and I called my sister, and I said, we've got to get back to Harper's Ferry. I told her why, and she said, yes. She died three months later. And I think many of you knew her. 
she was a light of the world, full of fun and joy and love. And all of us who knew her miss her so. Thank you, God, for having sent her to us. Any word I say today is for Jane, and there's the chair she would have been in right there. Well, there's a speech to give. (laughs) On a November morning in 1859, the morning train pulled into Fergens coming up from Rutland. On board was Mary Day Brown, a great abolitionist. She was bringing home the body of her husband, John Brown, who four days earlier had been hanged by the state of Virginia for treason against the state for trying to start a slave insurrection by capturing the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. The Browns made their home in the Adirondacks near Lake Placid, and Mary Brown was coming to Virginia to take the ferry across the lake and up into the Adirondacks where he would be buried. John Brown failed in his attempt at an uprising, but what he did at Harper's Ferry set in motion a chain of events that made the Civil War inevitable. And so John and Mary Brown, who kept on as an abolitionist without him, and taking care of their 20 children, kept on. And the Civil War became inevitable and the slaves were freed. The Civil War had been a long time coming in Vermont. The slavery issue had burned bright since before the Republic of Vermont in 1877 adopted the first constitution in the hemisphere to outlaw slavery. Partly as a consequence, almost a century and a half later on May 1st, 1834, the Vermont Anti-Slavery Society was formed an adjunct of William Lloyd Garrison's National Association, which had been founded in Middlebury. Garrison had come to Vermont in 1828 and published an anti-slavery newspaper. It wasn't all that popular. His calls for abolition had strengthened since, and he was strongly advocating also for women's right to vote. And he broke precedent when he founded his society. He founded not only a national organization, but statewide organizations and local chapters that women could be members. That was something almost unheard of. And very quickly, within a year, there were 90 chapters in Vermont. And women joined by the hundreds and hundreds. Women were enthusiastic about going to war against slavery. They knew what slave wages were. In Norwich in 1843, the local women formed an abolition society stating in the Constitution, we believe slavery as it exists in this nation to be a direct violation of the law of God. Vermont women now had a chance to involve themselves in what was essentially a political movement. They also became very active in the temperance movement. Among the founders of the Vermont Anti-Slavery Society was Rachel Robinson. She and her husband Roland owned a farm in Ferrisburg and there they hired escaped slaves to work on the farm. Rachel happened to be in Randolph Center one day when another abolitionist Orson Murray spoke, and some of the locals came armed with rotten tomatoes and rotten eggs. And when he was halfway through his speech, they started to throw him, and there were threats hollered against his life, 
The historian Abby Hemingway, who was there, the great Vermont historian, believed that Murray's life was in danger, and Murray kind of towered behind the pulpit. She took him by the arm and led him out through the crowd to safety. He might have been in danger of his life. Rachel was tough. Incidentally, Abby Hemingway of Ludlow, the Vermont's great historian, was also an abolitionist, spoke throughout the state against slavery, and published a book of poetry uh, on anti-slavery subjects. The abolitionists steadily came to Vermont. Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Frederick Douglass many times. In West Hartford, an escaped female slave spoke. Francis Ellen Watkins read a poem that praised Julia Ward Howe and Harriet Beecher Stowe. I thank thee for thy kindly words that graced thy pen of fire and thrilled upon the living chords of many hearts, lyre. For the sisters of our race, thou'st nobly done thy, thou part, thou hast won thyself a place in every human heart. Over here in Plymouth, Axa Sprague was the most famous resident of Plymouth before you know who came along. <laughs> she was a spiritualist nationally famous. She went all through the country giving seances. And every chance she got, she spoke against slavery. She died in 1862, sadly, as the war was really just getting going. And she died with the promise that she would return. She is buried in Plymouth, and I have not yet seen her. <laughs> but I expect to. Probably the powerhouse of all anti-slavery women in Vermont was Clarina Howard, born down in the southeast corner of Vermont in West Townsend. As a teenager, she married a Baptist minister and moved to upstate New York, but she quickly divorced him. Women didn't get divorces in those times. In 1840, she returned to Vermont and married George Nichols, publisher of the Brattleboro Paper. He soon became ill, and she took over the paper and turned it into an anti-slavery paper and a women's rights paper. In 1852, she became the first woman to address the Vermont legislature. And in the middle of her speech, the all-male legislature stood up and started hollering and taunting and stamping their feet, but she kept on. She kept on with her message that women should at least be allowed to speak and vote in school district elections. She was tough. She finished it. The next year, the second husband died. She went west to Kansas. She got involved in anti-slavery work in bloody Kansas. That was tough stuff. And then when the war began, she came back to Washington and started an orphanage for the children of freed slaves. And she became friends of Susan B. Anthony and Mary Lincoln. Before the war, I will be sitting down and standing up alternately because I have a hip that's trying to give out on me. So anyway, uh, up and down here. Before the war, Vermonters got a look at Southerners here in Vermont because many wealthy Southerners came to Vermont to get away from the Southern heat. And they came to the spring towns, the mineral spring towns, Brattleboro. Stonewall Jackson was in Brattleboro in 1860, just before the war began, trying to cure his stomach ailment. He was a hypochondriac. <laughs> they came to Woodstock. They came particularly to Clarendon Springs, where the old spring house still stands. A Clarendon Spring woman wrote, Of the southern clientele, a few dowager ladies, an occasional woman with a few children, a smattering of dashing young men who rode well, played cards, and danced well. 
but by far the largest percentage were charming, affected young women with a trunk full of beautiful clothes, and as far as the natives could see, a head full of butterflies, <laughs> giggles, incomprehensible chatter, and nonsense. <laughs> they might have a maiden aunt in tow, and always a mammy or maid to supervise everything. Slaves, you see. In Pittsburgh in 1856, Samantha Kelly went to Alabama to, church, to teach school, and she wrote in her diary on June 4th, and wow, oh, how miserable warm this day is. <laughs> and this room is awful. Finished reading Uncle Tom for the second time this morning. I read it with intense increased interest. Many of the expressions that were new and strange when I read it before are now strangely familiar. Oh, slavery. And I, a native New Englander, am in the midst of it. She was teaching Uncle Tom's cabin in Alabama? That must have been a brave young lady. In Peachum, the Johnson family, a family of abolitionists. Oliver went to Massachusetts and worked with Garrison Martha and Caroline, his sisters, moved to North Carolina, and when the war began, taught freed slaves. Martha died there. In Danville, I should mention Sally Stevens. Sally Stevens had a no-good husband and five children, and he ran off, left her with the kids. She made a living taking care of the sick and dying. She had one son who was badly crippled, named Thaddeus. She raised him. He went with her to help care for the sick. He grew up, Thaddeus Stevens, to become the most powerful member of Congress during the Civil War. And if you've seen the movie Lincoln, uh, Tommy Lee Jones plays him and accurately depicts that he got the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery passed. Remarkable woman, very much thanks to his mother. As the war need, neared, war meetings began throughout the state to encourage enlistments. In Brookfield, in the United Church, a local paper said, every time a woman rose to enlist, the house broke forth in applause and cheering. Then the governor began to make all manner of inducements to get the men to enlist. He even offered to give any man who would enlist his choice of the girls in the church to kiss. <laughs> in Guilford, a notice advertising a war meeting began with the words, Women Invited. That's something new. May 15, 1861, in Bristol, a procession led by 25 ladies carrying the national standard began a war meeting there. In Wheelock, women gathered in the town hall right after Fort Sumter to make a huge American flag. And the Caledonian record said, with ready fingers wrought their country's emblem, although the ruthless hand of secession had sought to efface 11 stars from the constellation of its field of blue, in faith they placed a star for every state. Linden, June 14, 1861. Ladies of this village met at the town hall yesterday in large numbers. It was an unusual sight, that of 75 ladies and 11 sewing machines in that large hall making shirts, sick gowns, sheets, pillowcases. The men began going to war. From Stowe, farm wife Olive Cheney, wrote letters all through the war to a daughter in New Hampshire. You'll see a tone in the women's writings that you don't get in men's writings during the war. They weren't going to war. They weren't so caught up in the hysteria. She writes, last Monday, your father took Edwin to the center. That's Waterbury Center. He enlisted for the war. To war he had to go and said he should go. If father did not give his consent for him to go the first chance he got, he would take off. 
It comes pretty hard for your father to give him up. He's, he's made so much calculation for him to be on the farm. It is strange what makes the boys want to go to war. If the boys hated to go as bad as we hated to have them, there would not be much fighting done, could there? All four boys, all four of her boys came home safely. Mary Jane Ackerman lived in Bristol, New Hampshire. She saw her husband enlist. Then she put her fourth sons and three daughters in a buckboard and headed a hundred miles north to Canaan, Vermont on the Canadian border and rented a house in Canada which she soon found out was not in Canada. It was a hundred yards south of the Vermont border. So she got rid of that, moved north into Canada, and stayed there until the war ended, kept her sons out of the war, and then she went back to Bristol. Uh, two of the sons got, went back to Canaan. Houses still stand up there that they built. Brattleboro was the site perhaps more Civil War activity than any other community in Vermont, site of the big military camp. Most of the regiments went to war from there, and also there would be a hospital there. A young uh, a teenager, uh, Mary Estes, was a gifted writer, and uh, she kept a diary through the war. A poem of hers appeared on the front page of the Brattleboro paper when the 4th Regiment went to war. You see that tone here again. Slowly through the misty street comes the measured tramp of feet, and a thousand forms sweep by, going forth to win or die, stepping to the roll of drum, down the darkening street they come, ready each to bear his part, to resign it may be life, eager but to join the strife, Will they tread the homeward track? Lord in mercy, bring them back. Mary Estes was a child when the war began, really. Late in life, she gave a series of lectures on Brattleboro history. Uh, Brattleboro uh, would be the site of the largest of all the three hospitals in Vermont. She said, but a few weeks passed when in my early home we did not have guests there, those who came to say goodbye to some son or brother who was off, uh, off going with his reg regiment. Some good women of our village were nurses. How much good they did and how many lives they saved can never be told or realized. It was a great relief to the people of Brattleboro, whose homes are on Canal and Main Street. For before the hospital was filled, nearly every house was filled with sick soldiers. The games of the children on the street during those prior years partook of the war spirit, <laughs> amputating arms and legs, <laughs> carrying out each other on stretchers. Nationwide, two organizations formed with chapters throughout the North, the Sanitary Commission and the Christian Commission, to, to help the sick and wounded soldiers. Vermont women in most towns fast formed chapters. In Waitsfield, the town history, the society was organized auxiliary to the Christian Commission. And many army supplies prepared by bands of devoted women met regularly in the hall of the brick tavern in the village and shipped their things directly to the front. The Bridport Ladies Sewing Circle met in the Congregational work at Church. In Woodstock, the center of activity was the Elm Street home of Mary Colomer, wife of United States Senator uh, Jacob Colomer. That house is still there on Elm Street, right beside the Congregational Church, to the north of it, yes. Barnett, in Barnett, Vermont, two houses from the Congregational Church, Laura Moore lived. Town history says she worked tirelessly providing items for the soldiers. In each village in the town, women made warm garments for the men in the field, delicacies for the sick and wounded, and they went farm to farm collecting. 
and Derby Line Elizabeth, the wife of Congressman Portis Baxter, went door to door collecting. And when she was in Washington, she and her husband, Baxter, worked as nurses in the, in the military hospitals. And the war meetings began to urge the men to go, to enlist. July 7, 1862, Lucy Ann Rose wrote from the family farm in Addison, over near Middlebury. Last Friday the 4th, we had a Snake Mountain excursion. Estimated there were 2,000 people there. Cannon and martial music. A recruiting officer tried to get men to sign for the Army. Cousin Marvin Clark says he would like to go. His mother says she cannot hear talk of that. It would kill his father. Marvin enlisted and was killed at Gettysburg, fighting Pickett's charge. In Vermont at the time of the Civil War, there existed more than 30,000 farms. It's hard to believe today, isn't it? It was like that when we were kids, right, bud? 30,000 farms, mostly hill farms. There, life was ever a challenge, from early morning milking through the workday, in the barn, the fields, work went on and on. One of the reasons for large families was the help the kids could pr provide to Ma and Pa. But now the able-bodied men and sons and fathers were leaving. Vermont had 315,000 people as a population at the time of the Civil War. Nearly 35,000 served, most of the able young men. The great home front dramas were played out on the farms. So much of the burdens fell on the women. Some families could afford a hired man, but not very many. Early in the war, Hiram Spencer wrote to his wife, Angelina, up in Newark in the Northeast Kingdom, be as careful as you can and get along as easy as you can till I get home. And then I will try to help you so that you won't have to work so hard. Okay? I should like to come home now, but I can't, as things are now as I got to work for Uncle Sam. Hmm. Letters from the home front are rare. They're hard to find. The soldiers read them, threw them up. They had to carry them, you see. Soldier letters are a dime a dozen. In Orange, Vermont, up toward Barrie, Royal Flanders left his wife, Hannah, and six young sons in a mountain cabin, little farm, and enlisted. He came home on leave in 1863 for two weeks and left his wife pregnant. She soon wrote that she was destitute. I want money very bad for the children are perfectly shirtless. He didn't come home till the war ended, though she begged him to. He re-enlisted once. And then he came home at war's end, and she was promptly pregnant again, and then he went off again to work at the Army Hospital in Brattleboro. And he came home in six months and fell down dead. So now she has eight or nine kids. And she soon was placed in an insane asylum. It was just too much. After two years at the Brattleboro Asylum, she came home, took all her children back. They'd gone to different homes. Raised them all, and they became model, every one of them, a model citizen. Amazing story. In Craftsbury, John Paddleford left wife Caroline to run the farm. She wrote him, It has been frozen most of the time, though it's thawing today. I am quite alone today, excepting grandmother and the baby and Jenny. Oh, how I wish you was by my side. She went on to talk about the high price of oats, the good work of the hired man, and how she purchased, just purchased a new horse that she named Abraham Lincoln. 
Sergeant R. Dutton, Silsby, 13th Vermont Regiment, and his wife, Miranda Brown. Farmers in Moortown with seven children. Now this is the farm that could afford a hired man. He writes every day after he goes off to war in September, 61. It, it's two months before she replies, and he's mad. So who do you think was busiest? You know? <laughs> he finally writes this letter that, that gets her mad enough to send back a letter. Now I need some gloves, and if you have not got time to knit them, you had better send me some good buckskin lined ones. There. That brings a letter from her. We have engaged Oscar Bailey. He will work for $18 for one month and then work for his board through the winter. It is now past 10 o'clock. Everything is still, still and girls quiet and I can think. I hardly had time this evening for Oscar is so rattle-headed that in spite of all my sober feelings he will keep me laughing and I hardly know which I am the most provoked at him for being so nonsensical, or at myself for being so foolish as to laugh at him, but you know my weaknesses. But I assure you that though I laugh ever so much, it does not drive you through from my thoughts." Okay? And then, this is interesting, women have a savviness about what the war strategy, you know, they're watching the papers. November 14, 62. I suppose before this you have heard of General McClellan's removal from office. There seems to be more dissatisfaction with the management of affairs than I have ever seen before. The 600,000 men that were going to end this war in double quick time going into winter quarters without striking a blow. I tell you, Dutton, when you left home I thought it might accomplish some good. Ah, <laughs> uh -huh, right on. In East Montpelier, Hannah Pitkin, a farm wife, writes in her diary of the Civil War, in the vigor of young manhood they went, one and another, who were household treasures. Perhaps the last news was seen on the battlefield or taken prisoner, and then the long months elapsed. At last came the fearful died at Andersonville. Three military hospitals opened in Vermont as the casualties increased, particularly in 1864. Montpelier, Brattleboro, and Burlington. The Montpelier Watchman newspaper ran this notice, we are soon to have among us the brave boys who have been disabled by wounds and disease. We shall want sheets, pillowcases, blankets, pillows, comforters. Send to the hospital or surgeon William B. Casey enough for a thousand men. Two weeks later, another letter appears from the same guy saying, thank you. Everything that we needed is here. Two weeks. My God. Some women, mostly officers' wives, went to war with their husbands. Mary Farnham from Bradford was the wife of the second in command of the 12th Vermont Regiment. They were camped in northern Virginia. Mary Farnham's diaries are kept at UVM. Mary Farnham was a pistol. When she, when she went down to, to uh, join her husband, she took three weeks to get from Bradford down to Virginia because she talked to New York and had a lot of fun with her friends. And then when she went home, she made her husband mad again because she took three weeks to go to Boston before she went home. I mean, she's, she's very individual. But listen to this. She's a great writer. This is the morning after her first night in the army camp. When I opened my cabin door, such a splendid scene I never held before. Twenty fires were burning, six hundred or more men hurrying about. Beyond glowed the blood-red tint of morning. She knew it was coming. Those guys were headed for Gettysburg. Princess Psalm Psalm. Ellen Elizabeth Joy grew up in Georgia, Vermont, just south of St. Albans. 
on a farm. She was a small, beautiful lady, independent, and before she was out of her teens, she went to Washington. And there she met an Austrian nobleman. And his name was Constantine Alexander Johann Nepomunk Prince Samson. And they fell in love. And he bought her a wonderful horse. And she became a famous sight riding that horse around Washington. And then she went to the front to join her husband at the front in, in Virginia. And she took to nursing the soldiers. And then she and her husband became friendly with Abraham Lincoln. And they were invited to the White House once. Because Mary Lincoln hated her. There was no more jealous uh, woman in the history of the world than Mary Lincoln. And when the minute she saw Princess Somsom, that was it. The uh, Somsom survived the war, then went to Mexico to fight in the Mexican Revolution. He was killed there. She went to Europe trying to get some of the family fortune and died in destitution in, in Europe. Mary Winchester, a Middlebury farm girl in 1848, married Reverend Warren Winchester, pastor of the Bridport Congregational Church. He became an army chaplain assigned to a hospital in Washington. She took the, uh, their th seven children and went to Washington to join him. Mary wrote to her parents in Middlebury, their little voices uh, blend so well, we took them to sing at the hospital. And many a brave soldier had to wipe his eyes to hear them singing together as he was so forced to, forcefully reminded of his little ones at home. After the concert, four-year-old Nellie complained of an earache and sore throat. A doctor diagnosed diphtheria, which often led to death by suffocation. All three daughters died agonizing deaths, but son Willie, seeming, though seeming the sickest, survived. Incidentally, the, 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 that couple uh, losing those three kids came back to Vermont after the war and had 12 more children. In Eden, in the north, up in the kingdom, well, up that way, in June 62, George Emery enlisted in the 11th Vermont. He left his wife Mary Bell and six children behind. She soon went to Washington. She couldn't make ends meet to be with him. And he promptly got captured and died in Andersonville. She was destitute. So she went to the commander of the 11th Vermont and she got two jobs as a washerwoman. And she and her kids did the two jobs and supported themselves until the end of the war. The war wore on, Gettysburg is fought. Mary, Mary Estes in, Brad, in, in Brattleboro writes, the young women were the ones to solicit in different parts of the village. One friend, a schoolmate, and I had our part of the side of the brook, and I remember we collected, collected $100 in one hour after the battle. A Chester historian said that in that town, in 1863 after Gettysburg, we produced 17 sheets, 171 towels, 68 pounds of dried apples, 83 pairs of drawers, 49 cotton shirts, 18 quilts, that's a lot, 50 pairs of socks, 19 pillowcases, 20 pairs of slippers, rags, bandages, lint, and one pair of mittens. Nyland Pond, Susanna Aldrich's husband John died in 1852, leaving her four sons. And she took the, walked the two miles from her house to the station to put them all on the train and off to war. And three of her boys died, and one came home an invalid. While they were gone, she built herself a house out in the country. It's still there. It's quite a house. And every two nights a week she walked 
into town and back, no matter whether it was snowing, to make things for the soldiers. In Morristown Corners, Widow Gates lived near that hamlet with a son and a daughter. The son enlisted at 14 as a drummer boy in the 5th Vermont. In 1862, the daughter died. They had a little farm. The widow could not handle everything, so she went to Washington to see Secretary of War Edwin Stanton to try to bring her son home. Stanton would not see her, so she went to the White House. Lincoln did see her, and she came home with a boy. That's Lincoln. People got along by helping each other. In Waterville, up north, Mrs. H. Beard and Mrs. Curtis Beard, whose husbands have gone to war, harvesting, have harvested corn on their farm, made a husking bee, invited ten women of the neighborhood and hussed out forty bushels. Wes Fearley, Nancy Miles Kimball operated a knitting business affiliated with a Boston company, and she employed sometimes as many as forty women to knit, and that's how many of those women made ends meet. On connected farms along the Northfield Mountains in the Waitsfield Common area, women banded together to help each other work some 1,200 acres of farmland. They called themselves the Mountain Maids and their enterprise Floodworth Farms. In Peacham, Edwin Palmer died of wounds at Wilderness. While he was at war, his wife and daughter lived in many homes in the area, moving in with families to make their clothes, women's dresses, men's suits. As the state hospitals filled, the need for nurses increased mightily. One of those who took up nursing was a woman from uh, Northfield, Harriet Higson. And in the hospital at Montpelier, she met a wounded soldier, and they fell in love, and she married him. Harriet Hinkson lived to be 102, dying in 1945, maybe the last surviving Civil War veteran in Vermont. Every day she recited the 23rd Psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death. In June 1861, Dorothea Dix, a Massachusetts woman, once a crusader for mental health and prison reform, met in Washington with the War Department, who accepted her offer to recruit female nurses for hospitals around Washington. Some 9,000 women would serve in the federal hospitals, 3,000 under Dix. Also, many of the other hospitals were staffed by another Massachusetts activist named Mary Livermore. Remember that name. Uh, to the uh, history sites, Dix established strict standards. Recruits for nurses had to be between 35 and 50, matronly in appearance, <laughs> and with habits of neatness order, sobriety, and industry. Wages, $12 a month. Little attention paid to medical experience or training. She was flooded with applications from women throughout the North. Later, as the war got worse and the casualties built up, she dropped all consideration of looks. Amanda Coburn, a Glover girl, followed her brother Henry to war in the 3rd Vermont. She served through the war as a nurse, assisting in operations, driving ambulances. When requested, she kept soldiers' valuables in her tent. One night, a soldier tried to steal them. She shot him. <laughs> Not only did the hospitals increase the demands for goods for the women, but the soldiers themselves were demanding. Families sent boxes to the front, and railroad service was so good 
that even meats and, sea, and, and seafood were usually fresh when they arrived. Private Jonathan Blaise Dell wrote home to Cambridge, send some dried apples, some butter and cheese, and I will send some money as soon as I can get some, and I want 75 pounds of sugar, and I can sell it for 50 cents a pound. I want you should send a little can of molasses, a little bottle of camphor, a pair of boots, some horseradish, some vinegar uh, put in with it, and lots of other things. <laughs> Who's busiest, anyway? Captain Edward Horton from Chittenden. I received the box today you sent. The pies and the oysters was spoiled. The play had gone out of the oysters. The oyster drew should run in the pies, and they were all jammed up and moldy. No thank you. Still the demands for goods increased. From the hospitals in 1864, Burlington ladies produced 60, 84 haversacks, 164 woolen shirts, 168 drawers, 185 towels, 30 sheets, and much more. And that's happening in every town. The great historian T.D. Seymour Bassett, a friend of mine, long gone, wrote, for the first time, individualistic Vermonters were cooperating in a huge public enterprise, which proved its merit by helping win a great war. The immensity of the resources focused to this end, the complicated, extensive, and large-scale logistics, and the size of the labor force dwarfed all previous efforts. The people of Vermont had never been and never would be so unanimous about anything. <laughs> Factories were busy, as they had uh, uh, busier than they had ever been. Mills in Bridgewater, Woodstock, Winooski, Ludlow. Other towns produced wool for the armies, blankets, uniforms. Increasingly, the workforces were female. In Winooski, a dormitory was constructed for the young men and closely guarded. In Woodstock, by 1865, the women running the mill, which is now the, rec the recreation center down here, is what's left of that mill, and the, uh, the, the stone theater building. Uh, that's all part of that uh, Civil War mill. The women were demanding higher wages and fewer hours from the owner, Solomon Woodward. In Lunenburg, young Suba Thomas left home to work in the woolen mill in Lowell, Massachusetts. She came home sick and tired out in 1865 and soon died. This is a sad story. The Boston Post reported in 1864, a young girl, neatly though plainly dressed, was arrested by a police officer for improperly soliciting men on the street. When taken to the station house, she admitted the charge, but said she was compelled to adopt that course of life or starve. She came from Vermont with her mother and sister because they could find no employment there. On the farms, the strain increased. <laughs> Lucia Brown in Williston wrote in her diary April 4th, 1863, living by herself. She had two husbands had left her. I, in this forenoon and this afternoon, went to the Ladies' Aid Society. I went to sew and do all I can for the poor soldiers. One of Lucia's husbands had gone off to the gold rush in California. The other went to war. She wrote, The more I see of men, the more I like dogs. Anna Grant Glines, husband was a wagoner in the second Vermont, she's from Tungbridge, five kids. It rains and blows terrible and we have our wood to draw down out of the woods. It seems as if we should all freeze to death. My wood is so poor, I have got no money at all. I have to borrow from people and it's hard to get that. I have worked so hard today I am almost dead. Our daughter began to cry and I could not stop her for a great while and when it comes night, baby will start in again. Pa ain't here to hold her. I get out about, about out of patience sometime, and I think you ought to get discharged and come home. I think what you do here would be important, more important than what you're doing there. 
in Cabot, Mary Lance was engaged to marry Captain Abel Morrill when he came home on leave in 1864. Six weeks later, he died in the Battle of the Wilderness. The men of the town went to Mary's house to tell her the bad news. She thanked them for the message, went inside, closed the door, and never came out for 50 more years until they carried her dead to the cemetery. In Callis, Private Joel Robinson fought at Gettysburg, survived, and came home sick with typhus. Within weeks, four members of his family, three of them women, were dead of typhus. In Fairhaven, February 10, 1864, the ladies of Fairhaven are doing a noble work for our brave volunteers. Last Tuesday, under their auspices, a festival was held at the town hall. The contributions consisted of tableau vivants of rare exercises. That, what would happen is, you see, these ladies would decorate a stage behind a curtain, and they would, say, uh, recreate Washington crossing the Delaware. So they'd have people dressed up like soldiers, they'd have the boat up there, and try to make it look exactly like the painting. And then the curtain would be open for two or three minutes, and close, and everybody applaud, and then it would open ten minutes later, and there would be Whistler's mother, or whatever. <laughs> These were great entertainments, and they raised a lot of money. 1864, Middlebury Register wrote of the town of Leicester, We have not had a wedding in town this winter, something rather strange. The young men have all gone to war. In Brattleboro, Mary Estes, the memory of those four awful years seems to those who live through them like a dreadful dream. How often some of our own dead were brought back here for burial, the military funeral, the flag draped coffin, the muffled drums will long be remembered. And at last, at last, of course, it did end. April 12, 1865, right after Lee surrendered. Middlebury is a war, a, an end of war celebration. The paper reports loads of fair women and brave men in triumphal procession traverse, traverse the street with banners flying. In Manchester, the Equinox House received a letter from the White House canceling the reservations made there for that summer by President Lincoln and his wife Mary. Of course, Lincoln had been assassinated. To Montpelier came the First Lady, the former First Lady of the Confederacy, Varenia Davis to stay with an old friend, an old professor friend. The local people did not like her. I don't know if they told her that there had been a gallows erected on the State House lawn to be used on her husband at one time. In Stratford, Janet Flanders, when she was 15 years old, she married Alcott Bacon before the war. He died in the Battle of Newborn in 1863. Janet lived until 1933 and never remarried, saying that she never found a man worth my pension. <laughs> if you married, you see, you lost your pension from your previous husband. <clears throat> In 1866, the women at, at Woodward's Woolen Mill in, in Woodstock went on strike. <clears throat> and the first day they did, they marched downtown walked into the most expensive restaurant in Woodstock, all ordered fine meals and charged it to Woodward. <laughs> By God, they won the strike. They got shorter hours and higher wages. I remember Woodward's daughter, Minnie Garrison. Oh my God. Judy used to wait on her there at the corner dairy bar there. Minnie's hamburger. <laughs> That's right. Nathaniel Burbank of Walden, veteran of the Navy. Granddaughter Irene remembered, Grandpa, I was a dear old man. Grandma used to listen to his stories about the war, but after a while told us kids, war wasn't as glorious as he made it sound. In Chitton, let's see, now in Bradford, Callista Robinson Jones. 
19 won elected national president of the Women's Relief Corps. While she was president, they managed to save the Andersonville prison site. That's why it's a national park today. In Chelsea, Clara Searles Bixby, husband had died at Andersonville. She lived 50 more years, never remarried. On his memorial stone at Chelsea, she wrote, God has marked every sorrowing day and mourned every secret tear. August 12th, August 12th, 1912, dedication of the Coventry Memorial. Statues of Grant, Lincoln, Dewey, and George Stannard on the monument. Here's what the New York, Newport Express said. Teams and autos and pedestrians were seen centering in from four and five routes leading into the town. It was estimated that between 1,500 and 2,000 people were on the ground. The key speaker was Josiah Grout, former governor, former cavalryman. I wish here to express the hope that sometime, somewhere in the most prominent place for national observation, the gratitude of our people will take form in the shape of a monument of the most lofty and enduring character in honor of and to the memory of the women of the Civil War who came home, who came, who came to the war and at home and in the hospital and on the field did so much in so many ways to encourage him who bore the brunt of the battle and to soften the severity of privations and to relieve the anguish and, suffer, anguish and suffering of his hardships. In 1992, historian Tom Bassett concluded about the Civil War, Vermont women enlisted for the duration. There's a new book out called They Fought Like Demons, written by two Smithsonian historians about women who passed themselves off as men and served in the Union armies. I found this in this remarkable book. Honeymooners Martin and Elizabeth Niles from Shaftesbury, Vermont, enlisted together on September 2nd, 1862 in the 14th Vermont Infantry and served together for 10 months. If that is true, that I have no reason to believe that it isn't. Elizabeth Niles fought at Gettysburg in defeating Pickett's charge. And now I'm on to the story possibly of a St. Johnsbury woman who may have gotten herself into the army. Mary Livermore, the great nurse, wrote, someone has stated the number of women soldiers known to have served as less than 400. I am convinced that a larger number of women disguised themselves and enlisted in the service for one cause or another than was dreamed of. Entrenched in secrecy and disregarded as men, they were sometimes revealed as women by accident or casualty. Some startling histories of these women were current in the gossip of army life, and one always felt that they had a foundation in fact, and speaking of Mary Livermore as we come to a close. On a winter morning in 1870, a passenger plane pulled into the station at Montpelier across from the State House, carrying a considerable number of women come to attend the meeting of the all-male Vermont Women's Suffrage Association. <laughs> From the train stepped Julia Ward Howe, author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, the unofficial anthem of the Union armies, written in the tune, to the tune, of course, of John Brown's body. He has sounded forth the trumpets that shall never call retreat, and there's a lesser known verse about Christ. He is coming like the glory 
of the morning on the wave. As Mrs. Howe was getting her baggage, she looked down the station platform and saw none other than Mary Livermore, that great Civil War nurse, Union General William Tecumseh Sherman, once said of Livermore, she ranks me. <laughs> These two women had seen much of the war, had helped shape its history through the four years of fire and fury. This day, Shao, uh, Howe shouted to her old friend, Oh, you great big Livermore! <laughs> and off they went, down the platform, arm in arm, off to war again for another cause, like the Civil War having to do with equality. And they never ceased in the fight for women's right to vote, for suffrage. And of course, well after they were gone, they got it done. American women finally won another victory for human rights. Such wars for the mighty causes go on and on and here a century and a half later, it seems that those wars are endless and that the trumpets must never call retreat. Thank you for listening. Let's get this door open. I don't know if it's warm down there, but it is up here. Uh, if you have any questions, I will attempt to hear them and to answer them. Uh, I would be happy if anyone is interested in one-on-one -on -one discussions. And I do have some books over there that I signed for nothing. <laughs> anyone, I'm happy to take questions. Yes, sir. But I've, I've read that Thaddeus Stevens' mother helped build a school in Peacham so he would have a proper education. <laughs> You just taught me something. <laughs> yeah, she was quite a lady. And Stevens came back to Vermont and built her a mansion, really. And he came often uh, back to Peach of Danville, you know, and uh, visited her. And he uh, got her a lot in the cemetery at Peachum, and which has a sign every year, perpetual care. So he had paid for that, too. Yeah, yeah she was quite a lady, apparently. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes? So you talked about um, women who enlisted with their husbands. Did they enlist as women? Like some of them? Well, there were, there were women who went with their husbands as right. women. But we know now that there were apparently a minimum of 400 women in the Northern Armies who passed themselves off as yeah. men. Certainly they had to have had the complicity of the some of their fellow, you know, soldiers. But we don't know how many yet. And this is the only, what seems to be solid proof of a Vermonter. But now I had a, I've had a call from St. Johnsbury that, that I need to look in the records up there because there may be somebody from St. Johnsbury. So I don't know how many we're going to find. So the ones that enlisted as women with their husbands weren't yeah. fighting in the war, they were... Oh, yes. Oh, they were. They were fighting. They were full soldiers. They were in uniform. Wow. They carried musket. They carried rifle muskets. And it looks like this one, Fort, she was in the 14th Vermont, and they were one of the regiments that fought off Pickett's Charge, and she would have been in the middle of the Battle of Gettysburg. That's wild. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to get a hold of those, you know. I've been stalled for 15 months. <laughs> Good Lord. That's the first talk I've given. In 15 months, uh, I was a little nervous up there. It's not, it's, I'm getting up to 700 talks now, you know? and uh, but I'm all set now. Anyway, I'm glad you came and you stayed. That was nice. Did Hi. John, did John Brown have four wives and 20 children? He had two wives and 20 children. He had, I think, he had five by the first wife and 15 by the second. Yes, they used to do their shopping in Virginia. Yes, they did. Yes, yes. yes they did. I, do it I can't complain, and you. <laughs> There's quite a few people here. That's the Fullertons who have been on my bus tours. Here's a whole row full right here.
one other thing. What did they use for anesthesia during the Civil War? Uh, they had uh, mainly ether. Ether came in in 1843, approximately. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was mainly what they had, and there was another one. I can't. But you think. never hear of them using anything. You, all you hear is the the, terrible operation. The northern, the northern armies virtually always had some kind of uh, of anesthesia. The, not always the Confederates, but most of the time they had it. So yeah. the stories about operations uh, without anesthesia are really pretty well overdone. Well, if they didn't have anything else, they got them drunk as hell. <laughs> chloroform, they must have. Well, they had some chloroform, yeah, yeah. But I had my tonsils out <laughs> when I was six years old with straight ether up at Randolph. Were you there? <laughs> but, but no, but, but I think you went that group and Bob Lewis was there, I remember. Then they just put the mask on and then poured on the ether. Oh, it smelled awful. I remember everything was spinning around. It was awful. They did 12 of us Woodstock kids that day. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh. John Brown is buried in North Elba, as you probably know. John Brown is buried in North Elba, New York. Yes, I've been and, there. And the graveyard, his stone and everything are enclosed in plexiglass because of people desecrating that. But yes. the house, the house that it was in, you wonder how 22 kids ever survived. I, it, I, I, I don't know how they, and they always had uh, black friends join them for dinner. Yep. I don't know how they did it. Uh, yes, uh, that's a wonderful site. I've spoken up there four or five times. The only problem with the John Brown farm is that they built the Olympic ski jump. Right. Oh. So it towers right over the darn farm. <laughs> what are you going to do? The house is there, and a lot of his things, his chairs, Bible, it's all. Yeah. Wonder. Wonder. Hey, we got it done. Somebody's looking at the food. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for listening.